The Lord be with you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bon Air United Methodist Church on beautiful January morning. It's so good to see you. We've had a lot of energy around the church all morning long, and so so glad to be worshiping uh, at this uh, time with you. I'm Bert Brooks, pastor and preacher today. Our, our minister of music is Kathy Toole. Uh, pastor Kathleen Monge, our pastor of congregational care, is participating. I understand we have Maddie May, who is with us today. So Maddie's good to see you today. Yes, and our sanctuary choir. And so we're looking forward to a wonderful day of worship. If you're visiting with us, just go ahead and claim your space. Claim it and be one of us today. We're so glad that you're here. Make yourself at home and enjoy this time of worship with us. There is a, an attendance register on your row. If you can find it and send it down, we'd appreciate it. But I do want to do a sound check. Am I, am I clear enough, loud enough? Do we need to go up? We're good? It, it, does that mean good or go up? Okay, good. All right. I know what this means, but that has a double meaning. So I guess we're good. How about the choir? Are you good up here? Good. Okay. Well, um, just a couple of quick things before we uh, begin our worship that I want to draw your attention to. Our Mission 2020 luncheon, for those of you who've made reservations, will be in 1101 immediately after church today. I do want to thank everybody for Caritas. Mike and Susie Stow reported at the early service that it just ran smooth and everything that was needed, the church provided. So thank you for your volunteer effort and whatever, whatever you did to make Caritas, once again, a, an important ministry of the church. I do want to just quickly uh, just point something out. This is not a Bonaire sponsored event. It's more of a Burt Brooks sponsored event. But on Wednesday, we have a Live to Lead simulcast that is part of the John Maxwell leadership world. And it's especially for professional people, maybe even young professional people, but all ages who would like uh, to increase their skill set and perhaps learn some new things from various leaders across the country. If you're interested in that, let me know. It's also on our website, trying to do something that's not so churchy all the time and expanding what we do for others who are working on their careers. So anyway, if you're interested in that, I would love to hear from you. The Chalkley Book Tree for Love of Books, Celebrating the Life of Lois May Kidwell has been set up in the Commons, and Sally asked me to remind you of that. Are there people here who will just agree to walk by that tree after service? There's some of them, just walk by that tree and see if that might be a, something you're interested in to make a donation to Chalkley. There are other announcements, just one kind of generic announcement. There will be a charge conference on February the 11th at 6 o'clock to approve a new endowment policy. Now, some of you might be interested in that. Some of them, Richard, may not say, well, good, I'm glad I don't have to go to that. Um, but I, I make that public notice right now that we will be looking at a new endowment policy on February the 11th. Other than that, I think we, uh, we have covered what we need to cover. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
For those who are able, I would invite you to please stand for our call to worship. I waited patiently for the Lord. God inclined to me and heard my cry. God drew me up from the pit and made my steps secure. God put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and believe and put their trust in the Lord. opening prayer. Author of creation, maker of all that is, by your hands the seasons turn and the days grow longer. As sunlight expands irresistibly into the dark corners, shed your light into our hearts and into our world. Renew our spirits that we may reflect your goodness to all who are alone or discouraged. Renew your church, Holy Spirit, that we may worship and serve with joy of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. And now before you're seated, I'd like to invite any children that would like to join me for a story, if you will come on down and let them make their way and then while they're coming down, would you turn to your neighbor and welcome each other to church this morning?
Good morning. Good morning. Do I have everybody? I think I do. Good. Let me make sure I'm on. Yes, I am. Well, I want to teach you my special greeting. You may already know this. I'm going to say Jesus loves me every day. Or, Jesus loves me every day, and every day Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me every day, and every day Jesus loves me. Well, you all, I am so glad you're here today because... When we read the Bible this morning, one of the things that Jesus is going to say is, Come and see. Come and see. Has anybody ever said, Come and see? You've asked them a question, and you know, like, What's cooking for supper? And somebody says, Come and see. Has that ever happened to you all? Yeah, yeah I think so. I, it happens to me a lot. I'll ask a question, and somebody will say, Come and see. Now, I've got this book right here, and I want you to come and see. Does anybody know what this book is? What does it say? Do, can you all read that, some of you? It says, The New English Dictionary. Can you verify that for us? <laughs> yep. New English Dictionary. I want you to come and see. What do you do with a dictionary? Do you know? Do you, do you know what you do with one? You look up words, don't you? You want to see what they mean, and you want to see how they're spelled. Well, if you didn't know better, you would go dull, 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 a dictionary, wouldn't you? But I want you to come and see this dictionary. Notice that if you pass it by, you may miss something. This dictionary is not a dictionary at all. It's a safe. How about that? It's a safe. There's not one single page in this dictionary. How about that? Have you ever seen a dictionary that's not a dictionary? Well, you have to say, I'd like to see, because we could have missed this. We could have gone away and said, Pastor Bert showed us a dictionary today. We've seen dictionaries. We know what they look like. We've got one at home. But I bet you don't have a dictionary like this. You know what I lock in my safe here? M&Ms. <laughs> yes, I do. Important things of my life. How about that? Now, the problem is I have forgotten the combination, and I can't get in there, but one of these days I will. So I want you to listen carefully when, the, when we read the Bible and it says, come and see, and Jesus' disciples come and see where Jesus is. And that's who we are. Jesus is always inviting us to come and see the love of God. Well, let's have a prayer before you go. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for inviting us to come and see. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Well, as they are returning to their seats, we do have a minute for joys and celebrations. Does anybody have any good news they'd like to share this morning? Anything? Kathleen, why are they so quiet this morning? I don't know, but I would like to thank the prayers, yes, and that's a joy. Yes. And my mother um, is now in a rehabilitation facility in Katy, Texas, mm -hmm. and she is gradually improving. So thank you for the prayers. That is a joy. That is. There's lots of joys this morning. So um, did anybody, like, uh, let's say, get a raise this week? <laughs> Anybody get a raise? If so, I'd like to present you with a new pledge card. Um, <laughs> if that's a joy or celebration. You know, lots of good news. I mean, I, so much good things have been happening around the church from, from Caritas, but I do want to point out an individual. 
Tracy, you are good news. Tracy Gale, and we're so glad you're here today. From last Sunday to this Sunday has been a miracle, has it not? And uh, you were hospitalized with something unknown that had taken your, 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 taken your mobility away from you. And you, you're back in church on Sunday. So if people here do not believe in miracles, I want them to talk to you afterwards. Uh, yeah. So we're glad that you had it. Maybe that made the difference, that prayer shawl. Yes, so it's good to see you this morning. And uh, we'll pray for continued healing. Yes, any other good news for us this morning? Mary Catherine? Dave Burton and Joe Tuck making good progress from, from their surgeries. Well, we do have a, a, some prayer concerns, um, and Kathleen's going to share. But Monica, we've got you in prayer. You've been under the weather this week, and children have been sick, and so we want to pray for full health at your house. Yes, indeed. Well, we're glad to see you this morning. Yep. And it's good to have Gwen here with worship. She's on our prayer list. Yes, I see Gwen back, back there. there. Yes, we're glad to have you back. Y'all have had a, uh, some, some challenges over the holidays, but you're back with us today, so we're glad to see you. Yeah. So some prayer concerns for us to continue, including those that are in our bulletin on the prayer list, uh, to continue to keep Melissa and Rob and their families. She is still in the intensive care unit. They have requested no visitors right now just to allow her to heal. Perry Myers, uh, to keep him in prayer as he recovers from surgery. Tracy, yes, yay, two thumbs up, and uh, Joe Tuck. We do have two families to keep in our prayer with the death of their loved ones. Um, to keep in prayer Doreen Edwards and her family at the death of her husband Colin uh, last week and also to keep uh, Patsy Wilburn and her family in our prayers with the death of her husband, Vaden. Um, and there may be others that I haven't been told or Bert has told, so keep them in prayers. Any others that, we do, that I haven't listed that we need to be lifting up? Join your hearts with mine, let us pray. Almighty and sovereign God, we give you thanks when prayers are answered so amazingly, visibly, and tangibly with healings that happen, with stability that happens. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for those wonderful ways of answering prayers that touch our lives. And we also know that we can trust you when prayers don't seem to be quite answered the way we wanted them. And we are waiting. Sometimes we do wait patiently, as the call to worship said. But other times, Lord, we become impatient, waiting for you to answer our prayers. Be patient with us, Lord, your children, during the times of questioning and doubting. We truly come before you as your children, humbled to be able to come to your throne of grace at all times with both joys and celebrations as well as concerns. For those that are continuing to heal following surgery, for those who are in need of comfort and strength for days and weeks ahead as they mourn, the death of a loved one. And we come before you, Lord, as a children in conflict with people having different opinions and frustrations with each other. We need your spirit to guide us through these rough, stormy weather. Help us to have patience with each other. 
Help us, O oh Lord, to listen and to hear the needs and the concerns that even people have when they have difference of opinions. Lord, we do lift to you every elected and appointed official across this great nation. As decisions are needing to be made that not only affect us, but affect your children around the world, people that we agree with and people that we disagree with. May your spirit be this guiding spirit in all those major decisions. Help all leaders to listen to you and to listen to each other, that they are aware of consequences that can be made by decisions that may be made too quickly. And help us all, Lord, to really look and to see your son in the faces of those who are vulnerable, those who are weak, those who are struggling, and help us respond as you would have us respond as we pray together the prayer your son taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Our first reading this morning is a Psalm of David, Psalm 40, verses 1 through 11. Listen to the word of God. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog, and he set my feet upon a rock and made my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, here I am in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is in my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips. As you know, O oh Lord, <clears throat> I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great generation. Do not, O oh Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. Here ends the first lesson.
The second reading is from the book of Isaiah, the 49th chapter. This is a part of Isaiah where Isaiah, the prophet, is writing to the people of Israel in captivity at Babylon. Uh, the Babylonians had overwhelmed Jerusalem. They had th torn the temple down and sacked the city, and they carried the people of Israel away into captivity, in slavery at Babylon. So this powerful letter is written to these people in slavery, if you can keep that in mind, but keep also in mind, I believe this letter is also written, written to us here at Bon Air today. So think about that as you hear these powerful words. Listen to the book of Isaiah 49, one through seven. Listen to me, O coastlines. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp soil, sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I have said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward is with God. And now the Lord says, that is the Lord who formed me in, the, in his womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him for I am honored in the light, in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. The Lord says this, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore, restore the survivors of Israel. I will, in addition, give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by nations, the slave of rulers. He says, kings shall see and stand up, princes, 
and they shall prostrate, prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. This is the word of God for all God's people. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Please stand as you're able as we hear and receive today's gospel reading from John chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. And this reading follows our reading from last week of the baptism of Jesus. So that, that might make it a little better to understand where John is taking us. <clears throat> the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher. Where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The word of God for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <clears throat> Well, a lot of four-letter words get thrown around our culture, do they not? Some are easier to take than others, but the one that proper people seem to use a lot is this four-letter word, busy. I caught you, didn't I? You were hoping I wasn't going to say anything else. Busy. How many of you have used that word at least once this weekend? Busy? Anybody has used it at least once? How about this morning? Have you used it this morning? Well, busy. You're not the only ones. I'm not the only ones who are busy. Even though we say uh, the Spirit and the Scripture tell us to slow down and to prioritize. The gospel writer John has Jesus just as busy as Jesus could possibly be. He's all over the place. He's over here at the Jordan River getting baptized. Today he's in Jerusalem. Tomorrow, the third day, he's going to be at Cana at a wedding in Galilee. He is busy. But the gospel writer has to move Jesus quickly so that we understand who this Jesus is. And it's interesting, let's just do a little bit of Bible study in John, and just for a second, it seems kind of redundant, kind of repetitive how John opens this. Now Sam, listen at this, I won't go too far. The next day, all right, that's day two, he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I've got it. 
Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We know what that means. Jesus comes to take humanity's sin to the cross and to, and to be the advocate and to allow us to live free as God's people. In other words, there's nothing held against us. Jesus has taken away the sin of the world by being the Lamb of God. And then John says, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. Now you have to think about that one a minute. That one's not so obvious, is it? So John is saying that Jesus came before him, John the Baptist after him, even though Jesus kind of came after him in, in calendar terms, but ranks ahead of him. And then John goes to say, I myself did not know him. Well, I would say you did, John, because I have been to the Christmas play. I know that you are relatives with this Jesus. I know that your mother and Mary were kinfolk. And we at Bonaire know that too, don't we? But John says, I myself did not know him. Well, I'm not going to unpack that because who knows what that means in terms of did they ever cross paths as, as, uh, as children or growing up? That's, that's not even relevant to the writer John. He's not even interested in that. As a matter of fact, John has never seen the Christmas story, the writer John, because Matthew and Luke wrote the thing. So John doesn't have a clue about angels and, and shepherds and uh, magi. He knows nothing about it. All John knows is that the light came into the world and the darkness could not overcome it. So I, don't, I give John credit. He didn't know. Then we ask, well, why didn't he know? Well, I don't know why he didn't know. So I'm just going on what he had to say here. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason that he might be revealed to Israel. Okay, we know that. And John said, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. We know that. And then it looks like he repeats himself again. He says, I myself did not know him. That's the second time in three verses that John says that. But the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I think I got that the first time around. He repeated himself. A little bit different, a little different nuance, but the same thing. And then John says, And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So John is kind of signing under his own name what he knows and what he doesn't know by saying, And I myself did not know him, says it twice, and then I myself am testifying to these things. And so, that's the end of that little kind of uh, prologue to Jesus' baptism. Then it says, the next day John again was standing with two of his disciples. Well, just to make this fun, they had probably made it back to Jerusalem or some small town not too far away. Were they standing, just visiting with people? Were they, you know, at a restaurant? Were they just enjoying coffee? What were they doing? It sounds like they're just standing there. And Jesus comes by, and then John says, Look, here is the Lamb of God. Well, to fast forward that a bit, John had some disciples. We don't know all who they are, but we do know from Scripture that John had certain followers himself even before Jesus showed up. Two of John's disciples go to Jesus and say, where are you staying? Now these are not, now you've got to read this carefully and a lot of times in church we don't have time to really get to the details of these things, but once you read this thing carefully you will understand that these original disciples, the two were actually John's disciples who go to see where Jesus is staying. Now, Jesus doesn't say, what difference does that make to you, or it's none of your business, or, you know, I'm just staying wherever I can lay my head. No, Jesus invites them to come and see. 
And to me, this is where the invitation to Jesus begins in the Gospel of John. One of the things that I have learned over the years and I try to share with you and others is that, is that Jesus is not afraid of our questions. Not afraid at all. God is not afraid of us asking the profound and important questions in life. As a matter of fact, the invitation is come and see. Come and take a look for yourself. We were reminded of that in the Easter story where Thomas said, I will not believe until I touch with my own hands. And Jesus says, go ahead. Go ahead. That is a point where so many of us draw the line. We want to know. We want to ask the fundamental questions. But so oftentimes we don't respond to the invitation to come and see. To take that step toward Jesus. Jesus is not even apparently upset if we touch his garment. We are even given the story of the woman who had been uh, bleeding for years and years. And she just worked her way through the crowd until she could touch his very clothing, and he did not rebuke her, but did ask the question that something went out of me that people want, and that is healing. And she was healed, was she not? I think the point I would like to make, and make it week after week, is Jesus is not afraid of our questions. Jesus is not afraid of us asking questions about life, about anything that is troubling us or anything that we believe needs to be a societal or cultural change. I like that. I like that about Jesus, that I am invited to come and see. Now, the writer John goes and says, it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, you have to ask, what difference does it make? Maybe it was 2.30 in the afternoon. Does it really matter? Maybe it was 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, the only reason I feel like he said it's four in the afternoon is because I could actually write a sermon entitled, It's Not Too Late in the Day to Come and See Jesus. That's a sermon in and of itself. Because by four o'clock in the day, I suppose life was winding up, especially uh, in the winter time where the days are short. And so I could even make a theological point that no matter where you are in your life's day, whether you're at the beginning of the day or whether you're at the end of the day, it's not too late to come and see. And that's good news to me. It's not too late. And so as we try to ask even more questions what is the purpose of where are you staying? Now, for you and I, it sounds like the word staying, where are you staying, means where are you temporarily spending the night? Like, if someone says, where are you staying, they're assuming you're staying in a hotel, you're staying with friends, you're staying with family. But it's an assumption that says we're not assuming this is a permanent address. Now, in some cultures, where are you staying does mean permanent in the transition. Because in Jesus' day, these were nomads, many of them. They were not going to have a permanent address. So where are you staying would certainly be a legitimate question. And in some cultures, as my studies have shown me, that where are you staying and where are you living are the same questions. Now here's where we've got to go deep and go wide and go big on this question. Because something happened to these two disciples when they accepted the invitation to come and see where Jesus was staying. They went and they stayed. It says that they now are disciples of Jesus. 
Do you know of people from time to time that go into something new and they never go back? They have found what they're looking for, something they have been searching for. They have decided that their life will be part of this new thing that has been revealed to them and they don't go back. Well, from time to time and place to place, we see lives so changed that they are not going back, that they have chosen to stay where they are and live their lives out. Well, a story that is fun for me about an entity that chose a new place to stay. And I'll tell you the story, but I will keep it quick. It was around 2006. Not that 2006 was a banner year. I just know that the calendar that I am using today dates back to 2006 with one incident that opened a door. I was sitting at my dinner table with my family and we were enjoying whatever it was, mac and cheese or whatever the evening meal was, and I heard this scratch, scratch, scratch at the door, at the back door. I said, did you all hear that? What was that sound? Oh, we didn't hear anything, Dad. We don't know what it is. Scratch, scratch, scratch. I hear something. I'm going to go take a look. And I looked at the back door and there was this big cat scratching on the door. I came back in, I said, there's a cat out there, don't anybody go out there and encourage that cat. Don't talk to it, don't pet it, and whatever you do, do not feed that cat. And let's pretend we never saw that cat. Of course, everybody's right there looking right there, wanting to see it. I said, that cat has a home somewhere, and that cat needs to go back home, and we don't need to hold that cat up. That cat's on a journey, he's looking for something. Far be it for the Brooks family to get in the way of this cat. Well, the good news was the next morning the cat was gone. I said, Phew. boy, we dodged that one because my children were at an age where they would have grabbed that cat in a second and called it their own. You know what I'm talking about? Are you with me on this story? I said, that cat is gone. So, peace. We dodged that one. Sat down at the dinner table that night. Wasn't even halfway through, scratch, scratch, scratch. I knew it. I would recognize that sound anywhere. I went out and looked, and there that cat was back again. Well, by then, I learned through various sources in the family that somebody had put a bowl of milk out there. <laughs> and that was that. I said, we are going to find this cat's home. And so I went to a couple of places around where we live, uh, a vet's office. I even called the county animal control. I even, um, there's a pet spa out near me. And I said, surely somebody has reported this cat missing. They all looked at me, no, no, nobody's reported this cat. And so, and so I didn't know what to do with the cat. I mean, you know. I didn't want a cat. It was not my goal in life to have a cat. Um, and it's still not, to be honest. But one thing led to a ne next, and that cat more or less told me, I have come to live with you for the rest of my life. Sometimes we do need to move to a new place a new place to live. And Jesus is inviting these disciples to come and see. And they said, we want to live here with you. The Bible says, it's, calls it abide. Abide in me and I will abide in you. I am the vine, you are the branches. You produce fruit because you are connected to me. And so Jesus was not afraid like I was to invite God's people in to a new place to live. And I'm not talking about just the address. I'm talking about the life that one would lead when they accept the invitation to follow. And really that's what we're seeing right now as Jesus assembles Jesus' followers so that they can then walk with Jesus and change the world. 
I know you abide with Jesus and I abide with Jesus, but sometimes we forget that that is really our address. If people were to ask us theologically, where do we live? What is your address? Then we might say, it is wherever Jesus calls us to be. That's the address. So many people in our world don't live there. Even Christians don't live there. They, their address is, is brokenness. Their address is chaos. Their address is, is depression and uncertainty and addiction. And they want desperately to get out of that place. And it's hard to get out of that place. But the invitation is always open. Come and see. And I suspect that if you've ever seen, you stay. You stay a disciple of Jesus. Well, this morning before I left, I fed Miss Kitty <laughs> for now going on 14 years. <laughs> she still won't leave. <laughs> and I guess we'll keep her. It's funny, she chose us and said, I am coming to your house to stay. And so I give this to you. What is your address? How do we reach you? How do we know where you are? Where can we find you? Amen.
you may be seated. That was a powerful song that we just sang. Um, to trust that abiding in me and me abiding. Did you think that too? When you're singing that song, what God's calling us to do? Through Christ, that's a powerful song. And we have an opportunity to respond with thanksgiving in our hearts as we give our gifts and our offerings to God. If the ushers would come forward.
I invite you to join with me in the prayer of dedication. Dear God, source of light and love, all things belong to you. You generously share with us the blessings of home, food, friends, and the gift of life. Receive and bless these offerings, though they are but a portion of what you have given us. May our gifts and joyful service strengthen your church in its efforts to share the good news and compassion with everyone we need. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Go forth now in peace. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you and be with you all today and forevermore. Amen. Amen.